Dear colleagues, welcome. Thank you for joining us in our second lecture of this Clinical Trials Masterclass. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you uh, to, a, to the second lecture, uh, which is part of the first module focusing on heart failure. Um, Johannes Petuchnik, Dr. Johannes Petuchnik, who is a um, resident at our cardiology department at Charité in Berlin, um, organized uh, this first module as the lead of it. And uh, Johannes, I would like to um, hand over to you to introduce our excellent first um, uh, lecture today. Um, dear colleagues, if you have questions, put them in the chat, put them in the WhatsApp group, whatever you like. And um, I think uh, we will have a great discussion after the lecture with Professor Cleland. Um, the clinical trials masterclass will focus on clinical trial design um, and to make us um, fit to perform better trials in future. So, uh, Chabit, thank you very much. Um, and also um, a very warm welcome from my side. Um, um, Professor Cleland um, is um, glad enough and, and, and um, to um, join us today. And Professor Cleland is a cardiologist and director of the internationally renowned Robertson Center of Biostatistics in Glasgow. He qualified from University of Glasgow completed training um, in St. Mary's and Hammersmith Hospital in London and was awarded a senior fellowship by the British Heart Foundation. Um, he was appointed professor at the University of Hull and uh, later on at the National Heart and Lung Institute, um, Royal Prompton and Herfield Hospitals and uh, Imperial College London. Um, his, main his main research interest is heart failure, including its uh, epidemiology and prevention and development and implementation of guidelines. He has participated in a number of randomized trials to study intervention for heart failure, including um, KHF, PEPCHF, and heart circle studies. Um, he has been involved in research um, on the role of myocardial hibernation, contributing to heart failure and its treatments, including beta blockers and revascularization, diastolic, diastolic heart failure in the elderly, ventricular resynchronization, implantable hemodynamics monitoring devices, atrial fibrillation and heart failure, and advanced electrophysiology. He founded the European Journal of Heart Failure and is past chair of the EEC Working Group on Heart Failure and the British Society of Heart Failure. So without further ado, we are very happy to have him and are looking forward to hearing what heart failure actually is from a trialist perspective. Well, thank you for the introduction. I, I feel exhausted after it. Uh, so um, yeah, I suppose it's uh, done, done a few things. Uh, and I have to thank uh, David and uh, yourself for uh, this kind invitation to speak. Uh, I'm very flattered. It's a very prestigious uh, institution and group of investigators. And of course, a special thanks to Johannes for helping me with one of the most recent clinical trials in this area, the Homage trial. So uh, Johannes made a, an important contribution to that. So thank you. Uh, so uh, with Without further ado, we'll uh, progress to uh, my uh, lecture. Uh, and it, uh, I've chosen a title, which is What is Heart Failure? And I think this is uh, absolutely key. If you are conducting uh, randomized controlled trials uh, in this area, uh, then it's important that you define uh, heart failure well. Uh, and I don't think we're doing a great job. And uh, okay, so. I need to get the slides to advance. There we go. Um, so I think we can all agree that heart failure is common, especially amongst all people. It's probably quite a serious condition. And there's many causes, uh, but it's perhaps the final common pathway of those many causes, valve disease, uh, um, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, amyloid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, first of all, perhaps we might get a bit philosophical and think about what the what's the purpose of a diagnosis. Uh, and of course, if you're dealing with a sensitive, uh, uh, a serious disease, you want your diagnostic test to be sensitive. Um, because uh, rather than specific, because diagnostic uncertainty can always be resolved by further investigation. But if you don't actually make it onto the first step of thinking about the diagnosis, uh, then you're lost at that point. And 
you know, there's lots of different reasons for why we might want to make a diagnosis. It's partly the scientific classification of disease. But if we want to know about the epidemiology, then we have to have a definition of what, uh, what we're going to include. Uh, it's important uh, in terms of informing patients on the nature of their disease and the prognosis. Uh, a diagnosis is important in terms of choosing and implementing treatment strategic planning of clinical services. And of course, if you're going to change the diagnosis, then there's a potential huge impact on the, the clinical services that you might need uh, to, to meet that uh, change in the definition. Um, and then finally, uh, with respect to clinical trials for the selection and risk stratification of those you invite to participate in research. Uh, I thought I might just start with the Heart Failure Association Atlas on the Heart Failure Epidemiology and Management, um, which was published uh, actually earlier this year. Uh, and I think it just highlights the size of the problem that we have. So here's the uh, European countries, the incidence of heart failure. And uh, I guess uh, where charity is in Germany and we have a lot of German investigators, you can see your incidence is 6.55 per thousand uh, person years, which is uh, double that in the United Kingdom, which is three times that in Denmark. Uh, you can see, well, what's here is down in Spain. Um, yeah. So, you know, a bit odd that uh, the incidence varies so much around Europe um, and you know why is it so high in Germany are you do you eat more sausages and smoke more and have less good management of blood pressure in Germany than anywhere else or what's going on if we look a bit at the prevalence we see something rather similar you've got three times the prevalence in Germany than you have in Spain um, okay well um, Here's Hungary, double uh, the rate in Germany compared to Hungary. Uh, where is the lowest? Uh, maybe Sweden? Uh, well, maybe the UK. So maybe we're doing something. Is it that we're killing our patients more quickly so they don't join the prevalent pool? Or do we have a low incidence and uh, we're doing better in that respect? How about hospitalizations? Uh, so here we have uh, Germany. Uh, up there with uh, over 6,000 per thousand population. So I think it's per thousand population. Um, uh, here we have the United Kingdom is just uh, one sixth of what it is in Germany. Uh, Denmark, one third. Norway, a bit higher than Germany. So, you know, what's going on? Here's North Macedonia down at 931. So it doesn't look as though we're doing that great a job on uh, on on the epidemiology. Um, you know, you might believe these uh, data, um, but I think you would have to be very concerned. Here's the length of stay. Uh, this is a li little bit more reliable because it doesn't depend quite so much on diagnosis, and you can see it's pretty unifer uniform around uh, Europe, or at least. Uh, rarely changes by more than a factor of two. It might be that Germany is uh, different from the other countries. Uh, it's got more microclips than most, and it's got more uh, BNP testing in the emergency room, and it's got more left ventricular assist devices. Uh, you can see it's compared to the UK, uh, perhaps by a factor of 20. So uh, there maybe are differences in clinical practice, but does that really account for the differences in epidemiology? I think this is the best epidemiological study uh, out of, yeah, this is the best epidemiological study, uh, contemporary one at the moment. It's done in primary care uh, databases uh, across uh, England. Um, population of England is just under 60 million. And you can see that uh, for all ages, um, there are just under a million patients with a record of heart failure if you extrapolate this 4 million uh, 
patient sample out to the rest of the population. And over the last uh, uh, 12 years or so, between 2002 and 2014, there's been a 23% growth in the prevalence of, of heart failure in that period. Uh, notice the number of uh, comorbidities uh, that are there. Notice the growing number of comorbidities. That partly reflects the fact that these patients with heart failure are getting older. Um, uh, um, sorry, the, uh, here's where the, the heart failure populations peak, around about 75, 80, 85. So, Partly it is an aging population, but partly I think it's because there's better coding. Uh, people are coding uh, more of the comorbidities properly. And so that it's a combination of these things. One of the important things is that this is the same way of assessing the uh, incidence or prevalence of heart failure. Um, this is uh, prevalence on this side here, but here we've got regional incidents between 2002 and 2014. Notice the big regional variations. So you, even within the same country, using the same uh, method of assessing the incidence of heart failure, you can have uh, double the rate depending on the, uh, on the region. So uh, there is variation in the incidence and the prevalence over time, uh, this incidence is falling slightly. If you standardize it to the age and sex of the population, if you don't standardize it to age and sex because the population is getting a little bit older, then the crude incidence is rising slowly. Uh, if we look at the prevalence, then whether you look at the crude prevalence or the standardized prevalence correcting for age and sex, they're both increasing. But there is a major problem with these data, even though they are the best. And that is that the diagnosis is based on coding and therefore medical opinion and use medical opinion in the broadest sense of the term, because many of the people who do the coding are experienced coders, but they are not uh, medically trained. And these are by and large not based on left ventricular ejection fraction or natriuretic peptides. Now I've said before that uh, there are many causes of uh, heart failure, uh, and this is a rather good uh, diagram from a recent review that we did. Um, but one of the big problems that we identified in this review is undiagnosed heart failure. So I'd like to say a little bit more about that in just a moment. But before I do, um, just to remind you of how bad the prognosis is, uh, you look at clinical trials, but of course, clinical trials are conducted amongst, by, by and large amongst stable patients who are able to give consent uh, to participate in the clinical trial, who are willing to give consent. They tend to be optimists with a better prognosis. If you actually go back to the administrative data uh, and look at the all comers, um, and this is true uh, both in the UK um, and in the US, that the one-year mortality after uh, the first hospitalization for heart failure is around about 30%. Uh, and notice that large proportion of patients where uh, the first hospitalization with, uh, or the first diagnosis of heart failure is associated with that hospitalization. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And just to remind you that if you look not at the um, US data, which I think is a little bit wonky, uh, but if you look at uh, uh, robust data sets like the National Audit for England and Wales, the average in-hospital mortality is between 10 and 12%, predominantly in this elderly uh, group of patients. But what about the under-recognition of heart failure? Well, there's a closely allied condition, which is very useful. And we've used it on a number of occasions to try and take a sideways look at heart failure, and that's atrial fibrillation. So this is, again, going back to administrative data. This is looking at 
uh, 124,000 patients with a new diagnosis of heart failure, a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation uh, in um, uh, primary care in the UK. Uh, so you can see that 64% of these patients were neither had the diagnosis of heart failure and weren't receiving a loop diuretic. Now, loop diuretics are powerful agents that are used to treat the symptoms and signs of congestion. Um, and there really isn't a good reason uh, to use them otherwise. A little bit for end-stage renal disease, for a few patients with resistant hypertension, Teresamide, admittedly in Germany, is more widely used for hypertension, but it's very rarely used in the UK. Uh, this is furosemide and bumetanide is 99.5% of loop diuretic use. Notice that there are more patients treated with loop diuretics uh, than are people um, that's isolated loop diuretic use. Uh, without a diagnosis of heart failure. There's more of these patients than that's actually uh, diagnosed with heart failure. Notice that the, uh, the patients treated with uh, loop diuretics have a higher risk of hospitalization for heart failure, even though their diagnosis is, um, has been missed initially. Notice uh, that the mortality of patients who are just treated with loop diuretics without a diagnosis of heart failure is virtually identical to those patients with heart failure. So it's likely there's an awful lot of people with heart failure in this group who are just not diagnosed. And for those of you who are interested in uh, differences between men and women, uh, it does appear to be a predominantly a problem with women. It's a problem with men as well, but also um, uh, with women. In terms of, is this just a problem in the UK? Uh, the answer is no. This is an international study called the Sportif trial of atrial fibrillation. Um, the, uh, the registered cardiac dysfunction in this study and they registered use of loop diuretics, but they didn't actually uh, make a diagnosis of heart failure. So we don't know how many people actually had heart failure in this study, but we do know how many had uh, loop diuretics or left ventricular dysfunction. And you can see that approximately half of the patients had neither. Uh, and... Um, uh, third uh, were on loop diuretics, about a third had left ventricular dysfunction and about 25% had both. Uh, if you're looking at mortality or you're looking at morbidity mortality, so cardiovascular hospitalization or death, you can see quite clearly um, uh, the more problems you have, the worse your outcome. But notice that actually being prescribed a loop diuretic all by itself uh, is actually worse uh, in terms of outcome uh, than having an echocardiogram that shows that you've got left ventricular dysfunction. And that was a very broad term. It wasn't just a low ejection fraction. Um, that was a little bit old, but here's something a bit newer. This is the EMPA-REG trial. Uh, this is a trial of empagliflozin, uh, not in patients with heart failure uh, or not not primarily in patients with heart failure. This is patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, and th this shows you the rate of heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular mortality or all-cause mortality uh, according to uh, the same categories as I showed in the previous slide. So you can either have a diagnosis of heart failure or be treated with a loop diuretic or both or neither. Uh, clearly, neither is the best uh, group to be in. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and to have both is the worst group to be in. But particularly if you focus on this first 18 months of follow-up uh, in the placebo group, you can see that the patients, again, treated with loop diuretic, have uh, exactly the same mortality uh, as the patients with heart failure treated with a loop diuretic. And interestingly, if you had a diagnosis of heart failure, but you weren't treated with a loop diuretic, 
you had the same prognosis as neither. Now, the results are not quite so startling uh, in the, or not startling uh, in the uh, empagliozin group. And that might indicate, of course, that this is a group of patients who respond very well to empagliflizin. Um, and we're obviously pursuing this further, and we have other data sets showing that this holds up, that it's the patients uh, treated with loop diuretics without a diagnosis of heart failure have a very similar outcome to those with heart failure. So if we go wind the clock back a little bit uh, to... Um, a turn of the century definition of heart failure. Uh, I, I was actually responsible for the, the guideline here and uh, uh, for this uh, figure. Um, uh, and it had in the center that you had to have cardiac dysfunction uh, and you had to have symptoms. And if you had that cardiac dysfunction and symptoms, it was called heart failure. Um, you could then treat the, uh, the heart failure symptoms persisted, you still had heart failure. If your symptoms were relieved, but you couldn't withdraw the symptomatic therapy, then you still had heart failure. So I thought it's, uh, it's quite a neat uh, algorithm, which I think has stood the test of time, at least until now. This is the new definition of uh, uh, universal definition of heart failure. Um, I think it's actually pretty similar to the one I've just shown you, just it's got more colors. Um, it is very much based on symptoms and signs, uh, but then using natriuretic peptides and maybe other evidence of congestion um, uh, to support the diagnosis. The problem with symptoms and signs is that they've got low specificity, they're late manifestations of heart failure, and they're often severe when first recognized. So you're often, the patient requires to be hospitalized by the time they develop symptoms and signs of heart failure. So I think this is a problem. Now, uh, two out of the three people that uh, slide have heart failure. Uh, all three of them have an elevated NT pro BNP. Uh, and none of them are symptomatic. Um, so do they have heart failure or don't they? Um, two are taking loop diuretics, uh, have a diagnosis of heart failure. All three have an elevated natriuretic peptide. Um, uh, none of them uh, will say they're symptomatic. Uh, what's going on? Well, the answer is they're watching television. Um, uh, this person doesn't have heart failure. They've got quite a lot of uh, edema of the foot. Um, if you actually have tight elastics on your socks, uh, you'll often find that your feet are a bit swollen at night. If you travel uh, on a long haul flight, so then uh, an awful lot of people who don't have heart failure will have peripheral edema. If you've got a bit of arthritis in the ankle, you'll develop peripheral edema. So not a great sign. Um, you know, uh, we rely on patients to uh, tell us exactly what's going on, uh, but sometimes uh, communication, well, there's a communication failure. Um, so patients may simply not have symptoms because they don't themselves. And it's very interesting if you take a patient uh, who's been referred to a heart failure clinic, ask them if they have symptoms, and they'll often say no, uh, walk them along the corridor or up a flight of stairs, and they start puffing. Uh, and they say, well, I, I never normally do this. I normally walk more slowly, so I don't develop symptoms. So you can see the problems. And uh, the problems can get worse and uh, worse as you uh, try and think of the number of different ways that a patient might interpret what's going on, uh, as opposed to you who are looking through a glass darkly, I think. So everyone gets breathless if they exert themselves enough. A uh, chap on the right there is uh, pretty breathless, but he's got excellent cardiac function. Uh, you can be fat, you can be unfit, you can have lung disease, joint disease, or simply maybe old age. Uh, can all make you breathless. Um, and avoiding it prevents breathlessness. 
Um, but the time you develop breathlessness at rest or, or can't lie flat, then that's pretty severe. Uh, and it, as I've pointed out, peripheral edema has got a poor sense to specificity. And it's a manifestation of late and severe, usually right heart disease as a consequence of pulmonary hypertension due to chronic left atrial hypertension. Where is the diagnosis of heart failure made? Well, uh, this is a large study from the United States um, uh, looking at uh, uh, about 2 million patients with incident uh, adult heart failure. Um, you can see they've spliced and diced the, the data in a number of ways. But if you look at the uh, uh, that uh, 1.6 million people with complete data, you can see that almost half a million of them uh, will have the diagnosis made in the acute care setting. So they're, they're coming to hospital with severe symptoms uh, requiring treatment. Uh, and But many of these patients have had uh, symptoms for uh, weeks or months uh, before presentation but just the patient hasn't felt uh, the need to bother their doctor or they have bothered the doctor and the doctor wasn't impressed. Uh, the situation in the UK is uh, even worse than that. Um, so you can see that uh, amongst men uh, and women, then it's uh, uh, the... Uh, sorry, you can see out of uh, 36,000 uh, hospitalizations up here in total, only 7,000 of those diagnoses were made in primary care. 28, 29,000 are made uh, at the time of hospitalization. So it's, uh, it's a major problem. Uh, most of these patients have comorbidities, of course, and the common ones are hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease uh, down here, uh, diabetes. So a lot of hospital presentations. Uh, and like the US data, an awful lot of these patients uh, uh, seeing their GP with symptoms that might be related to heart failure, but the diagnosis being passed over and left until the patient is sick enough uh, to require uh, hospital presentation, usually with breathlessness. Uh, so just to take you, remind you that this uh, presentation at hospital with a first diagnosis of heart failure is not good news. So you've got uh, one in three chance of being dead uh, by the end of the year. So how complacent are you? Should we really wait for symptoms to appear before we're willing to make a diagnosis of heart failure? Just imagine if you did that for cancer. So I'm not going to make your diagnosis of bowel cancer till it's obvious that you're bleeding or you have melina or your breast cancer until it starts to ulcerate. Um, I'm not going to diagnose your glaucoma until you've got visual loss, uh, symptomatic visual loss. I'm not gonna diagnose your anemia until you're feeling so tired and fatigued that you have symptoms. And when it comes to cardiometabolic disease, you know, we don't wait until you've had a stroke till we diagnose hypertension. Uh, we don't wait until you've gone blind before we diagnose diabetes. Um, you know, we, we diagnose renal failure on a serum creatinine. Um, atherosclerosis, uh, we don't necessarily wait for somebody to have an infarct. For atrial fibrillation, again, we don't have to wait for them to develop palpitations or a stroke. Uh, so why do we have to hang on to the bitter end uh, till the patient's got symptoms before we diagnose heart failure? And I think this is a useful diagram in terms of thinking about what's going on. Uh, so basically, it's as usual, we've got the seeds and the soil. And the soil is the prodrome. It's the hypertrophy and the fibrosis and the myocardial scar and the genetic uh, mutations. Uh, mutations are ones that uh, lead to uh, abnormal uh, phosphorylation of the, tit the titan. Uh, so these all set the scene for uh, developing 
uh, uh, heart failure. But then you need a precipitant, uh, so atrial fibrillation, an acute coronary syndrome, or an infection. And if things, if your the soil is not ready for the seed, uh, then you know that seed has got to be robust and have a big hit uh, to cause heart failure. On the other hand, if everything is set up for the heart to fail, uh, then it only takes us, you know, the, the last straw uh, that breaks the camel's back, as we say in the UK. Um, that very small insult may then cause congestion, and then the congestion uh, drives heart failure. So heart failure is the syndrome, it's not a disease. Uh, there are many causes of cardiac dysfunction that makes it quite difficult to uh, <clears throat> define heart failure on the basis of the cardiac dysfunction. But it does have this final common pathway of congestion, which I would remind you is a cardiorenal syndrome and not just a cardiac syndrome. And so early detection of congestion might be a useful strategy in terms of early diagnosis of heart failure robust diagnosis of heart failure and early uh, intervention to stop uh, disease progression. Um, or... And for that reason, we spent some time, um, uh, we actually started this before the Heart Failures Association uh, initiative on a universal definition. Um, so um, uh, we've uh, so I'd like to introduce the concept to you now. So basically, uh, heart failure, we think should be cardiac dysfunction associated with congestion. Uh, so if you have both of these things, uh, then you have heart failure. There can be some patients who are congested. Uh, you could imagine uh, 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 patients with severe renal failure who are uh, developing water and salt retention, um, you know, perhaps they could develop uh, congestion without major cardiac dysfunction, be few and far between. Um, it could be uh, the adult respiratory distress syndrome where you might develop pulmonary congestion without cardiac dysfunction. So there could be at least theoretically a small group of patients who are congested but don't have heart failure. Um, on the other hand, I think there's many patients who have cardiac dysfunction who are not congested. Uh, and so what do we mean by congestion or what markers of congestion do we have? I think we have two uh, markers that are really useful. One is the raised NT pro BNP, which just can be done on a blood test, which can be done by any nurse or doctor who's capable of taking a blood sample. Um, and the dilated left atrium, which of course means that you have to have some expertise uh, in uh, echocardiography and access to some specialized equipment. Now congestion, I think, is really at the heart of heart failure. It drives cardiac remodeling, uh, particularly the atria, but also ventricular remodeling is driven by congestion. It's the driver for symptoms and signs. It's also the driver for arrhythmias. If you get rid of the congestion, your risk of atrial fibrillation will drop. Your, drift, your risk of VT uh, will drop. Congestion is the driver of hospitalization. Most of the people who are admitted to hospital are congested in one way or another. And also uh, it drives death either through the arrhythmia or through worsening heart failure. And uh, so, uh, we published this variations of this um, uh, uh, diagram in both circulation and the European Heart Journal. Uh, I think very useful to uh, give you an idea about the importance of congestion. When you've got mild heart failure, then your risk is of vascular events and suddenly rhythmic death. But as your uh, heart failure progresses, more and more congestion is the problem. Um, uh, and you can see that although arrhythmia risk actually increases as your heart failure gets worse, your likelihood of surviving an arrhythmic event uh, declines. Um, and 
uh, it's swamped by the rise and death uh, due to congestion. So I think this is a helpful diagram and helps explain some of those anomalies about uh, the, the sudden death risk and the severity of symptoms. So this is a famous uh, British cardiologist, Sir James McKenzie, who uh, I think was one of the uh, you know, great thinkers in terms of the pathophysiology of heart failure um, uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, and he thought about it in terms of damage to the heart and the, the rise in uh, pressure in the veins, but also a fall in arterial pressure. Um, and these conspire to cause water and salt ret retention and congestion in the tissues and uh, congestion in the vascular system. And interestingly, he did, uh, he was a, a cardiologist or at least a heart specialist. I'm not sure they had cardiologists in those days. Uh, and he, he did, regard, well, of course, there's no surgery for the heart at that time. Um, and he was very concerned about people just looking more and more narrowly at the heart rather than uh, taking a broad view of heart failure and remembering that there's kidneys and other organs involved in this. So if you think about normal physiology, um, you uh, go out uh, for an Indian meal, as I do, uh, well, last week. And uh, uh, if you like a nice, tasty Indian curry, and uh, you'll find that there's an awful lot of salt in that. Um, and so you drink a lot of water uh, because you're thirsty. So you have this water and salt bolus. Uh, your blood pressure will go up a bit and your natriuretic peptides will go up a lot. Your natriuretic pe peptide levels will probably double or treble uh, after this meal. And that will increase water and salt excretion and hopefully normalize your blood pressure and your natriuretic peptides. So the BNP is the body's natural defense mechanism against congestion. If you've got congestion, uh, then for the same bolus of water and salts, uh, you'll also uh, get the blood pressure rise and BNP rise. The blood pressure rise will often be blunted because you have cardiac dysfunction. Uh, and uh, it may well be that your BNP rise is also blunted and you'll have inadequate water and salt excretion. You have uh, persistently elevated natriuretic peptide. Uh, you perhaps won't develop as much hypertension as you should for the water and salt uh, retention. You'll get atrial dilatation and that patient will go into congestion and heart failure. If you want to think of it more uh, in concrete way, here we've got uh, um, the uh, healthy person with uh, three liters of plasma volume and 11 liters of extracellular interstitial water. Uh, they eat their curry and uh, they, uh, they get a, a uh, weight gain of uh, 0.6 of a kilogram. Uh, most of that will be in the plasma volume circulating, so 20% rise. Um, for the uh, patient who is, uh, for the person who's perhaps not got uh, such a good cardiovascular physiology, um, the, there will be a 20% uh, gain both in plasma volume and the interstitial water. So they've now got a 2.8 kilogram uh, weight gain. And you know, I can, my wife's from Iceland and they have a thing called salt fish there, which is even saltier than Indian curry. Uh, and you can easily put on three kilograms of weight as a healthy person uh, within 24 hours of having a meal of salt fish. Um, so that must be uh, also in the extracellular fluid. So it's not just the sick patients who are not patients with cardiac dysfunction who are going to develop that. You can do it if in extreme circumstances in health. And so it goes on. And uh, you can see that by the time you've got a patient who has been admitted to hospital with worsening heart failure, you know, very often there'll be five to eight kilograms fluid excess in, uh, you know, just look at uh, what's happened to the plasma and extracellular water. In all of this, uh, the consistent feature, the final common pathway of left-sided heart dysfunction is a dilated left atrium. Uh, 
Uh, so if you actually want to know what's happening to the left ventricle, you know, take a quick look at the left ventricle and then move on quickly and look at the left atrium because the left atrium is far more sensitive uh, to what's going on in the left ventricle than the left ventricle is. Uh, of course, if you have mitral regurgitation uh, or you're a marathon runner or you have atrial fibrillation, uh, then you, know, you you have to be a little bit more nuanced about uh, the interpretation. Of course, mitral regurgitation uh, or stenosis is a uh, cause of heart failure. Um, the athletic heart is, of course, uh, you can get that from the history. And the natriuretic peptides, of course, should be low, assuming you're not going to take, you haven't taken it just after a marathon race. But atrial fibrillation, well, there are, is a group of people who believe that atrial fibrillation is a form of heart failure. Um, uh, and as I pointed out, many of these patients do have genuine heart failure, often missed as a diagnosis. If you look at your patients walking into clinic with NYHA class two heart failure, sorry about the um, fonts, uh, then you'll often find that these patients have evidence of congestion on ultrasound. They have lung B lines, they have dilated inferior vena cava, uh, they have a dilated uh, jugular venous uh, distension. Uh, you can pick this up uh, within 10, 15 minutes with an echo probe, uh, as well as say a lot more about uh, how the heart is functioning. And these patients who are congested will do badly, as you see in that uh, red line. So you can spot your NYHA2 uh, class 1, 2 patients that aren't really troubled by symptoms. A group of those have congestion, and that group will do badly. So if we want to update the, this uh, turn-of-the-century definition of heart failure, uh, we have to realize that in 2001, we had no generally accepted measure of congestion other than symptoms. We now have natriuretic peptides. We now have, uh, we now realize that we can uh, have ultrasound measures of congestion. Uh, we shouldn't just be talking about hef ref and systolic dysfunction, of course. We should be talking about cardiac dysfunction. Uh, and we can replace symptoms, I think, with congestion. We go on to uh, natriuretic peptides. Um, first thing I would like to say is if you are 73 and you have a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40%, but your natriuretic peptide level is uh, 125, as I'll show you uh, in a moment, you have the same prognosis as the general population of a similar age and sex. Your ejection fraction is irrelevant. Uh, and we see that again and again in analysis that prognostically uh, it's the natriuretic peptides just dominate uh, ejection fraction. And in fact, if you to know, you know the three key variables for prognosis and heart failure are your age, uh, your uh, serum creatinine, well, even better than that, your serum urea, and your natriuretic peptide. And with those three variables, uh, other things add a little bit, but they don't add much. So there are a goodly number of patients, as you can see, with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction who have normal natriuretic peptide levels, uh, and they have a very good outcome, much the same as the general population of a similar age. And as your natriuretic peptides increase, sorry, these are in picomoles per liter, so you always have to look out for units, translated them for picograms per mil. You can see as the uh, natriuretic peptide concentration increases, uh, the prognosis gets worse. A uh, lot of discussion from our American colleagues about uh, body mass index, and that body mass index may make it difficult to interpret natriuretic peptides. I think that this is overinflated. I think many of these fat people with a BMI of 50 in the United States are breathless because they're fat, not because they have cardiac dysfunction. Uh, 
um, uh, when we look at uh, the prognosis of patients who are really overweight with a BMI of over 40, you can see on this orange line, they're really not that much different from people with a normal weight. They perhaps, the relationship between natural uretic peptides and prognosis flattens a bit, but it doesn't flatten a lot. So I think that's overrated. Uh, here's a study of diabetes. There's some pa patients with heart failure in this, uh, um, uh, but not so many. Uh, and they looked at uh, the natural uretic peptides in uh, deciles. Here you've got the uh, composite MACE with heart failure hospitalizations. You can see that with your natural uretic peptides, just the one blood test was uh, as good as um, a 20 variable prognostic model in terms of determining these patients' outcome, both in terms of their composite outcome and mortality. This is another very interesting paper. Uh, this is uh, the DECLARE study. This was published in the European Journal of Heart Failure. Yeah, there it's down last year, 2020. Lots of things uh, that support what I've just been saying. So here we have the people with heart failure, first of all. So you can see there weren't that many of these patients. There was uh, um, uh, just over a thousand patients with heart failure. You can see that some of these patients uh, had uh, a NT pro BNP, which is really quite low, um, 102 patients down here. Uh, and these patients, despite the fact they had heart failure, really had um, um, not too bad a prognosis. Um, remember, they had to have vascular disease as well as uh, heart failure. Um, if you did have heart failure uh, and you had a raised natriuretic peptide, you did, as expected, have a bad outcome. Notice it's the patients with the raised natriuretic peptide who are benefiting from the SGLT2 inhibitor. Now move up to the patients who didn't have or weren't supposed to have heart failure. So there's 13,000 of these patients. Um, and uh, in fact, there's more patients with a grossly elevated natriuretic peptide, um, uh, 2,798 of them, uh, compared to the number of patients with heart failure. So this is uh, a much larger group of patients uh, at risk. And notice that their event rates are looking rather similar to the heart failure patients with this intermediate uh, natriuretic peptide phenotype. And also notice that the benefits of the SGLT2 inhibitors are really just confined to patients with an elevated natriuretic peptide. There was no benefit uh, for the majority of patients in the study, in the clear study, who didn't have elevated natriuretic peptide uh, levels. So you might then be interested in people who think they're healthy. And this is a large insurance program in the United States, more than a quarter of a million patients who said they didn't have heart failure, but the insurance, insurance uh, insurers uh, requested uh, natriuretic peptide uh, measurement. Uh, so this shows you the women and men, and this is the cumulative proportion uh, who are at or below this level. So uh, if we focus on the women, first of all, so uh, in this age group, 75% uh, had a value less than 75, uh, almost 90% had a value less than 175 for the 60, 69 year olds. If we go up to 80, 80 89 year olds, then uh, around about 90% less than 500. And uh, works even better for men. Men tend to have a slightly lower natriuretic peptide level than women uh, in health. If we look at the risk of mortality of this group of patients who were not thought to have heart disease, um, uh, you can see that with uh, an NT pro BNP level of greater than uh, 300, you're talking about a tripling of mortality or if you're uh, in this sort of younger age group, a 67-fold increase uh, in mortality uh, if you're in the 50 to 69-year-old age group. Um, there were some people who said, uh, this is just for the people without known heart disease, there were some people who claimed uh, 
who said they did have heart disease. So these are also in the analysis. Didn't really matter whether you said you had heart disease or not. The, the excess risk of natriuretic peptides was rather similar. So if we go diagnosis of heart failure rather than a symptom-based diagnosis of heart failure, I think we are going to require more uh, information on the cutoff uh, for BNP and NT pro BNP, and that will require data for many, many patients, probably millions of patients. And then we'll get uh, good age, sex, GFR, EF, and BMI adjusted uh, cutoffs. Uh, some people will say, well, we don't have any clinical trials in this arena. Uh, that's not true. I think that if you look, there are trials. There's the STOP HF trial. The Pontiac trial, Homage and Declare, all suggesting that perhaps if you uh, focus on a group of patients who have no diagnosis of heart failure but have elevated natriuretic peptides, then perhaps there is an effect of intervention. And of course, as we go forward and we design new trials and change the inclusion criteria, uh, then we'll get more and more uh, evidence. Um, there is a major sting in the tail, though, uh, and that is that once we um, start, if, if we shift to moving natriuretic peptides as the uh, marker of disease that we're going to treat, then there's going to be a huge increase in prevalence. Uh, and you know that may be, um, as, as you've seen, uh, a quarter of the patients with type 2 diabetes. It may be half or a quarter of the patients with uh, coronary artery disease have elevated natriuretic peptides. We know they do badly. Should we be treating them more aggressively? The other side of the coin, of course, is that perhaps we shouldn't be using expensive new treatments on people with normal natriuretic peptides because they're not going to benefit from them. Perhaps it would be better to have a surveillance program and start treatment once you see the natriuretic peptides increasing. So that's the definition uh, of heart failure. I hope that uh, in 2021 and beyond, uh, we're going to change from uh, a symptom-based one to one which is looking at the patient's risk, uh, congestion, and cardiac dysfunction with an increase in atrial volume being the key marker of cardiac dysfunction. Um, and there's nothing like uh, re uh, repeating history. Uh, you know, if you don't know your history, you're condemned to repeat it. I actually just came across this reference uh, earlier today, in fact, uh, which was Philip Poole Wilson's definition of heart failure. Now, Philip was the people who taught Stefan Anker, and he taught uh, me, and he taught John McMurray, uh, all they need to know about heart failure. And this was his definition back in 1985. Notice symptoms don't uh, appear in Philip Poole Wilson's diagnosis, definition of heart failure. So I think cardiac dysfunction with congestion, which is the cause of symptoms and signs and requires disordered renal function, uh, should be what we aim for in future clinical trials and clinical practice. So thank you very much, and I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Professor Clement. <clears throat> Johannes, would you go first? Oh, man, a lot of data, and thank you so much for everything, because it was really, it was really, really nice. Um, and I want to start with um, taking up the point, really um, talking about biomarkers, but also talking about natriuretic peptides and um, LV function now measuring um, um, ejection fraction. Um, because I have read, I think it was an um, editorial a um, few years ago from uh, Milton Pecker, really describing how measuring ejection fraction really came up. Um, and it was like in a um, psychiatry board um, in New York. And um, he, it was a colleague of his and um, he, told the story really like um, um, like a fairy tale. So it was very, it was very nice. So talk about um, biomarkers and LV function. 
a patient having an LVE function, an ejection fraction of 35, normal BNP, how would you treat him? Yeah. So I think that this patient's big risk is uh, in uh, arrhythmias. So, um, and, you know, the one drug that we've got, which improves ventricular function and reduces arrhythmias are beta blockers. And we've shown in the trade HF study where we attempted to withdraw treatment. I, I don't know if you've seen the paper, but uh, the key marker for uh, deterioration when you withdraw treatment is the rise in heart rate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, you know, in my mind, this was, just, this was just DCM. It was just um, dilated. Just DCM. Way, yeah. yeah. Well, you once you've got myocardial scar, you don't mm. see such big improvements in ventricular function with treatment. Uh, the treatments we've got today don't really, as far as we know, they don't fix the myocardial scar. They fix the myocardial functional dysfunction. Mm. Um, so uh, for a patient with an ejection fraction less than 35%, uh, uh, you know, I would be strongly tempted to uh, treat with a beta blocker. We have the SOL prevention study. Now, we, uh, we don't have so many natriuretic peptides from that study, but uh, it does suggest that you can prevent uh, disease uh, progression. Um, would I use an SGLT2 inhibitor? Uh, I think the answer is probably not, given the evidence from Declare and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, would I use a neutral endopeptidase inhibitor? No, I wouldn't. Uh, would I use an MRA? Well, if they had hypertension, I would. Uh, I think the MRA is a particularly good antihypertensive in this setting you get uh, you know, 10 millimeters of uh, mercury fall in blood pressure with a, um, a, an MRE. So, um, you know, maybe, um, maybe at the end of the day, it doesn't look so different in terms of the treatment. Uh, what is the big difference is in the detection uh, and the robust detection. Um, do your patient with uh, a normal natriuretic peptide and an ejection fraction less than 35%, are you going to put a defibrillator in? You know, that's a hard, tough one. Uh, are Maybe you gonna... 10 years, it would be a definite yes. Now, not so much anymore. No. So, yeah, uh, I get... I, you know, I think the big reason for thinking about changing the definition is that uh, I think that uh, the number of people diagnosed with heart failure uh, these days with congestion, with symptomatic congestion on loop diuretics is about 50-50. I think we're diagnosing 50% of the people. Uh, so that's a huge problem. And then on top of that, we have probably another 100%, you know, uh, tw twice as many uh, that have got raised natriuretic peptides who have a poor prognosis and where we're not identifying the problem and we're not doing anything about it. Um, there is one question from the, from the chat, uh, which is Dr. Bloom uh, from Berlin. Uh, thank you uh, more for the question, which is, uh, thanks for the excellent talk. How would you explain the paradox that congestion is central in heart failure pathophysiology, yet uh, decongestion by means of diuretic dose um, does not improve prognosis? Well, first of all, do we know that? Uh, and I'm not sure we do. Um, I uh, would remind you that thiazide diuretics are very good at reducing mortality, uh, perhaps in hypertension but why not in heart failure? And uh, I think the, uh, uh, we, we should remember the HIVET study of uh, resistant hypertension in elderly people. There must have been a lot of HEFPEF, undiagnosed HEFPEF in that population, must have been rife. And something like, uh, I can't remember, a 40% reduction in mortality, 40% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, who says that diuretics don't reduce mortality? Uh, I, I'll tell you who says that. 
uh, and that it was the ACE inhibitor companies back in the 1980s and 90s who, and it was marketing spin. And that's why we don't believe that uh, diuretics reduce mortality. Nobody's ever tested it. <laughs> yeah. There is, um, I, so yeah, introduced two markers of congestion, which is uh, one is uh, race anti pro BMP, second was dilated um, atria or the le dilated left atrium. Um, I was, uh, you know, when we think about the hemodynamic definition of heart failure, uh, we think about increased levels of, um, you know, left ventricular or left ventricular and diastolic pressure, for example, or surrogates by the uh, right cath, um, which I thought um, is a, would be the gold standard to refer to, uh, since I would doubt the, um, or since I was thinking of a lower sensitivity of anti pro BNP um, for for um, for congestion, I was I think you know a few weeks ago we had a talk by Professor Barry Bollock, um, who said you know that uh, you know especially here he has his, his main focus uh, which is uh, based on invasive hem hemodynamics, but he referred to especially in half PEF, um, uh, twenty to thirty uh, percent of the patients would not show increased um, anti pro BNP levels. Um, I haven't rechecked that, um, but uh, what do you think about uh, invasive, uh, invasive uh, hemodynamic definition of heart failure? Uh, well, I th you know, uh, I think there's an issue of feasibility and logistics. I think there's also an issue that, uh, you know, having a patient in a comfortable warm room, probably dehydrated, et cetera, et cetera, you know, how... Uh, how close to reality is that? So I think there are issues there. I think the second issue is uh, Barry works in uh, a place where half of his patients have a BMI above 40. Uh, so he is working in uh, uh, difficult circumstances. Um, I do think that there is, uh, you know, there's one s situation where natriuretic peptides uh, can be a bit misleading, and that's when you've got uh, constrict constriction, when you've got pericardial restraint. Uh, and we've discussed uh, this, and uh, Barry actually thinks that, you know, uh, some of his patients uh, are the, the reason for the normal natriuretic peptides may well be pericardial restraint uh, that these, uh, and that might be due to epicardial fat. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and that would fit with my hypothesis. So uh, I agree that uh, uh, there is a, a, an issue there with that particular body morphology um uh but you know the, the uh, con constrictive physiology is very different from the uh the uh, hef pef hef ref that we know and love um so yeah it's uh, uh, there will be exceptions to every rule it's just uh, i think that we're 10 times closer uh, to really grasping the problem if we get rid of symptoms and signs as the a necessary part of the diagnosis because it's just far too late in the natural history of the disease and uh, yeah um, you know we certainly need more research on uh, obesity and um, and natriuretic peptides uh, it's possible that ca125 uh, might be useful and uh, other people are looking at fgf uh, 23 and so on so there are other biomarkers out there and it may well be that uh, one biomarker by itself won't be enough uh, that uh, you know we, we might need a panel uh, but, you know, we already do that. I mean, you do T-sats, I hope, in Germany rather than ferritin, dreadful test. Um, but uh, with a T-sat, uh, you're measuring an iron and a transferrin. So, and all you ever know is, you know, you know often any laboratories just tell you what the T-sat is. They shouldn't. You sh they should tell you what the components are for a variety of reasons. But, you know, it, it may well be that you... Uh, 
measure NT pro BNP and CA125 together. And um, when they're both normal, you're very happy. Tell the patient everything's fine. When one is up and the other one is not, then you take a second look. And, uh, and, and of course, you might want to know what the patient's age, sex, serum creatinine, heart rhythm, etc., is in order to interpret the, uh, the biomarker. But the smart people are developing apps for that. So uh, we just need to feed them with more information. We discussed, you know, uh, the, we discussed how to, um, how to diagnose congestion or how to, how to um, identify congestion. On the other hand, when we think about the other component, which is cardiac dysfunction, especially in uh, preserved in patients with preserved ejection fraction, there is a, a whole discussion again. How do you know? How do we define the cardiac dysfunction, uh, which um, we see as a main pillar for the diagnosis? Um, well, I think left atrial volume is uh, is what uh, is the best and most reliable measure. Um, uh, I think that there is that caveat in the uh, markedly obese that we have to do a little bit more uh, research. Um, my, if my friend and colleague Pier Paolo was here, he would say that uh, he would look further. So he would look at the jugular vein with his ultrasound probe, uh, the, uh, the inferior vena cava. Uh, he would look at the lungs, uh, which is not all that helpful in the very fat um, because it can be difficult to pick up the B lines. Um, but also uh, the Kronigan group are very interested in looking at the renal venous flow as a measure of congestion. So, uh, you know, there's a, uh, an ultrasound panel. Um, the difficulty there is that you've got to have enthusiasts who are trained and expertise. And I think there is an element of operator bias. The beauty of the biomarkers is uh, uh, that they are, uh, pretty robust. If you look at any prognostic model for heart failure, very interesting. Um, you know, uh, it's usually the, the laboratory tests that are the strongest prognostic indicators because there, there's low levels of missingness. There's high laboratory precision. Yeah, you know, I think blood pressure and such are, are really powerful prognostic markers, but they're just not measured very well. <laughs> Uh, Maybe and just, if you don't measure yeah. things well, they won't really hold up yeah. when it comes to models. Taking up this point, is when we talk about um, LA function, are we really doing it right or doing it enough? Also, just not if we talk about, obviously, left atrial volume and volume index, but should we more guide ourselves in a direction that we go for left atrial ejection fraction or LA strain um, in an early onset of patients? Yeah. So I think uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, but of course, uh, the more complex you make things uh, and the more sophisticated, then, you know, th that's um, the less democratic, shall we say. Uh, the great thing about uh, the left atrium is that even the left atrial diameter is pretty good. At, uh, and left atrial volume will beat left ventricular ejection fraction every time for prognosis um, okay. um, I want and to steal also the discussion. yeah okay i want to steal the discussion in just away from evident with heart failure and to incident or risk for heart failure and my point is um we always in cardiology in the last years um we are told to look to oncology oncology tailored treatment precision medicine so And for the recent decades now, or at least the recent years, biomarker research and going for proteomics, peptidomics, um, microRNAs, um, and most recently um, genetics. Um, in your, do you think there will be um, a marker, um, a single marker that will be able to tell us the risk about heart failure or is it the problem as you said heart failure it's not a disease it's a syndrome and therefore it's it's hard to tell yeah i don't think that we'll find one marker that helps us uh, and even if we did find one marker um you know it has to be linked to a therapeutic um action 
to uh, to make it worthwhile. You know, I do think that uh, you know, I, I think the will we will find genetic um, risk associated with heart failure. I think we started with Titan, uh, an awful lot of people. Um, so, so for, for instance, uh, um, peripartum cardiomyopathy is more common in people who have uh, Titan uh, defects. Um, if you have an infarct and you have a Titan mutation, then you're more likely to have fart failure as a complication. So it is that sort of seed and soil thing. So, uh, And I think that we will find other genetic markers that indicate people who are predisposed to develop heart failure. There's a consortium called the Hermes Consortium, and uh, they probably found one or two more genetic markers that uh, that help tell us that this is a patient who is who's got the soil. Um, so when they develop atrial fibrillation, when they have their infarct, if they've got hypertension, then they are uh, more at risk than the next person. So I think it's going to be more like that than finding one magic marker that's uh, that's just going to solve the problem. I think that's uh, unrealistic. When you think you know, when you think about um, a clinical pharmaceutical trial um, testing a, a study drug, would you include New York Heart class and symptoms of the patients as part of the inclusion criteria to recruit the patients, or would you say anti-pro BNP or a congestive a marker for congestion should be enough if there is a sign for cardiac dysfunction? Yeah, it depends what sort of event rate you want. Um, and uh, one of the important things to remember is, um, and we, so, uh, we call it the Goldilocks effect, that you have uh, the porridge, I don't know if you know the fairy tale, but the porridge that's too cold, uh, those patients are just going to do well. You want to avoid them in your clinical trial because they're just noise. And then you've got the patients who are too hot, too sick, They're going to die, and it really doesn't matter what you do for them. So what you're looking for uh, is probably a BNP window. Uh, so you don't want it too high. You don't want it too low. And that's what we did in Homage. We had a BNP window. If you had a very high BNP, we said you need to go and get uh, seen by a cardiologist, not uh, in our clinical trial. Um, uh, the other big marker of risk uh, is uh, this issue of diuretics and there's all of these patient, patients out there so for me if a patient's taking a loop diuretic and they've still got an elevated natriuretic peptide uh, that's not so high that they're going to die in the next year or so you know those are the patients we want to put in the clinical trial um Uh, I am uh, on the, um, I adjudicate for a number of large trials where I'm not allowed to interfere with the inclusion exclusion criteria. And I can tell you, especially our US colleagues, are very keen on uh, recruiting people who are not taking loop diuretics, who seem to be in class two, three heart failure. So I'd say that they, they need to get themselves a better cardiologist. Uh, if they're not tr treating their patient's symptoms, those patients do remarkably well. So either loop diuretics are a poison and we really need to get rid of them out of uh, the pharmacopoeia or they are uh, you know, saving our drowning patients uh, and absolutely reducing their mortality. Uh, I'm sure they're doing one of those two things, but whether they're killing our patients or saving them, <laughs> I'd dearly like to know. Just a short comment. And really, I found this very astounding. And it's, it's um, talking about your work and coming back to PEPCHF. In PEPCHF, you had NTP, BNP was not an option, I think. And so, therefore... Not for inclusion. But yeah, we did, keep, we did have yeah. an analysis. Could you give a sentence on the on the PEPCHF trial for the colleagues listening to the trial? Yeah, this was a study of HEFPEF uh, where we treated with uh, perindopril or placebo, and uh, we uh, 
it was technically neutral uh, with rose tinted spectacles that I wear. Uh, it's a positive trial, but uh, but I admit that it's not uh, positive in the conventional sense. Um, the uh, and. What we did in terms of diagnosis was we said the patient had to have a diagnosis of heart failure. They had to be treated, um, this is off the top of my head, they had to be treated with a diuretic and they had to have a dilated left atrium or some other measure of uh, diastolic dysfunction. But it was really that sort of dilated left atrium. And what I found astounding, when you're talking about to exclude the very sick, you had the inclusion criteria they had to be able to walk on their own yeah. to exclude to exclude the, the very frail ones. And yeah. this is in, in these times, I have not seen this inclusion criteria anytime mm -hmm. since. So um, um, when we have this frail discourse now, but um, this was one. And I have been um, to, a, I think it was a CBCT and, and you gave a lecture and there you made the point, if you think about exclusion criteria, give a reason like give two pages yeah for every single exclusion criteria yeah. yes. you want to have on your trial otherwise skip it yeah oh absolutely some people uh, i've seen people come up with two pages of exclusion criteria and we're proud of it <laughs> well as an academic exercise yes but as a practical way of doing clinical trials the uh, you the fewer exclusion criteria you have, the better. I have uh, two, two questions. Um, one is, um, I tried to reach euvolemia in my patients so I can rid get rid of um, the loop diuretic. So obviously I have to rethink that. Um, or maybe... Um, no, maybe you're doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, the patients who don't need a loop diuretic do very well, but if you do need a loop diuretic, you'll die without one. Yeah, the question is, now, when do they need it? Is it only based on, uh, on symptoms or uh, is it when they have reached um, a certain level of um, um, biomarkers? You're asking a great question. Yeah. A so great question. The, the question yeah. is, now, how do you define or how do, how do I define euvolemia in that case? And the second is, um, so your introduction was, um, at the moment, we diagnose heart failure too late, so uh, we should um, have a better so a better definition should um, be uh, detect heart failure more upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and as far as I understand, left atrial um, uh, dilatation is, um, has a you know there is a reason behind it why it's dilated. Um, as far as I understood, it's mainly secondary to a um, um, filling pressures, for example. Um, and wouldn't it be better to refer to this filling pressures, pressures um, which um, precede uh, left atrial dilatation? Uh, yeah, so it's just a way of finding a practical way of, uh, of doing that. Um, you know, uh, you know let, let's look 100 years into the future uh, where... Um, you get microchipped at birth and uh, somebody puts a microchip in your atrial septum and uh, so uh, and that's fine but you know one day you you walk up two flights of stairs and the uh, the chip goes off and says mm, your left atrial pressure was too high after two flights of stairs you should start to do something so yeah i mean maybe we'll go that but you know, the, doing a cath on people, how often are you going to do that cath? Uh, where are you going to find all the cath labs? Are the patients going to set, consent to the cath? Uh, are you going to make sure that they, um, you know, they haven't been fasting for 12 hours or something like that and they're a bit dehydrated? And, uh, you know, I, I think you need to be quite careful with uh, the invasive hemodynamic side I, I think it's uh, can give us a lot of insights um i was a bit disappointed with the um uh, the guide uh hf study uh, with the cardio mems device um i always remember years ago uh, talking to diabetes colleagues uh, and we were debating whether there was any point in treating type 2 diabetes with hypoglycemic agents. I was saying, no, I didn't think there was any 
point in doing that, um, uh, which appalled them. And uh, but they did sit, turn around and say, well, one of the reasons why uh, hemoglobin A1C and monitoring hemoglobin A1C isn't all that helpful is that none of our drugs work very well. <laughs> in changing the hemoglobin A1C. You know, they they change it by 0.5 of a percent. And the SGLT2 inhibitors and so on aren't that much better. Um, uh, and we, another lecture. Um, so, and it, so it is with the cardiomems. The average change in mean pulmonary artery pressure in the cardiomem study was, I think, one millimeter of mercury. Do you think that you could change the life course of somebody by changing their mean pulmonary artery pressure by one millimeter of mercury? I think that they needed better treatments and that's why the monitoring didn't work and maybe they didn't give them enough diuretic. <laughs> uh, last question, when I look at classic cardiology uh, literature, there is a term of uh, congestive heart failure. And uh, when I listen to your talk, I don't know whether it is you know, obviously heart failure is always um, combined with uh, congestion. And what is um, non-congestive heart failure? Okay, so uh, this is a fantastic uh, point that you're making. And it goes back to Philip Poo Wilson, myself, and many of others, Pim Remy, uh, when we first pulled together the European Task Force on Heart Failure, and we sat down to discuss uh, terminology. And one of the first terms that we discussed was congestive heart failure. Um, and the view at that time was that many patients with well-controlled or mild heart failure would come into the clinic and they would have a normal venous pressure and they didn't have peripheral edema, so they didn't have congestion, but we thought they still had heart failure. Um, so we... Uh, and. Um, yeah, you know, I was there when it happened that the European Society decided to change CHF from congestive heart failure to chronic heart failure and get rid of the term congestion. Uh, so, of course, every 20 or 30 years, things come round in full circle. So now here I am arguing to put congestion back into heart failure, the term heart failure, that congestive heart failure is a thing. We now have a way of measuring it, which is by ultrasound and by natural, by biomarkers. Uh, so we can use this in our clinical practice and we should get back to congestive heart failure because I think it's a useful term and a useful uh, target for treatment. But no congestion, no heart failure, right? Uh, no congestion, no heart failure. You can, you can have shock. You could go into shock and not be congested. Uh, you dive presumably quite quickly in shock. Um, uh, no, I don't think you can be in heart failure other than being in shock uh, unless you're congested. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, I think I would have like a ton of other questions, but I think Professor Keenan, there's no other yeah. way that we will invite you back. At <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you will be kind enough to take uh, again the invitation and um, otherwise um, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's always a pleasure and um, a great evening. I think to you are in, uh, in UK right now, yes? I am indeed. So it's only 5.30. Yeah. I'm due in the pub by <laughs> six. So. <laughs> okay. So right. you come. Uh, Thank you very much for the kind invitation and uh, I hope you got what you wanted and I'm sorry if it's overrun, but I was enjoying it. So I hope you were too. I enjoyed it very much and I think the colleagues did too. Yeah. Thank you very much. In two weeks, we'll uh, meet again with Professor McMurray. Okay. You must send me the link so I can eavesdrop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very Bye much. Bye for now. Bye.